Good morning, good afternoon, good evening colleagues. Thank you so much for joining this uh, second webinar in a series of virtual workshops uh, that look at how partnerships are supporting the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, my name is Lotta Tähtinen and I'm the Chief of the Outreach and Partnerships uh, Branch in the Division for Sustainable Development Goals of UN DESA. And I would really like to thank all of you, uh, the participants and speakers for joining us today. A huge thank you also to our colleagues from the Partnering Initiative who have worked with us uh, to make this webinar happen today. Let me start by giving you a short background on the collaboration, uh, the 2030 Agenda Partnership Accelerator that has made this event possible today. This initiative, the Partnership Accelerator is a joint effort between our office, UNDESA, the UN Office for Partnerships, UN Global Compact, UN Development Coordination Office, and the Partnering Initiative. And it seeks to enhance collaboration between different sectors and stakeholders to, to accelerate effective partnerships in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. A key focus of the Partnership Accelerator is to work with UN country teams to bolster country-driven partnerships and national partnership platforms. Currently, we are working with resident coordinators of the UN system in Maldives, Samoa, Thailand, Trinidad, Sri Lanka, and Mexico. Let me now turn to today's event. As we all know, as the world is grappling and responding to uh, the de devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's clear that we need more than ever to enhance global collaboration and effective partnerships to build back better our societies and make them more sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. Recently, through the Partnership Accelerator project, we have launched a research report on partnership platforms with the generous funding support from the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development, which is our project office in uh, Republic of Korea. This report seeks to draw out good practices from several national partnership platforms that are developing around the world to catalyze and support new multi-stakeholder partnerships for sustainable development, often with a particular thematic or SDG-driven focus. We hope that this report and today's event will inspire all actors and stakeholders to work together to forge inclusive and effective partnerships at all levels. Now, let me hand the floor over to our first speaker, Mr. Dave Prescott from the Partnering Initiative. Dave will kick us off today with a presentation on the insights and findings that came from this research for the report. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Lotta. Uh, welcome, everyone. So uh, my name is Dave Prescott. I'm Creative Director of, of the Partner Initiative, or TPI, um, and I'm co-author of the report, which uh, Lotta just mentioned now. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes sharing a few thoughts drawn from that report to help frame the discussion today um, and touching on three questions. First, why are partnership platforms needed? Um, second, what kind of platforms are there out there? And third, what does it look like when they're working well? Um, so first of all, why are we talking about partnership platforms? Um, well, what, what we've seen in our experience of working in lots of different contexts and regions um, around the world, time and again, is there an, there's an expectation that simply by bringing different stakeholder types together, partnerships somehow magically happen. And of course, this isn't what happens in practice. Uh, without an intentional catalytic mechanism to help them become established and to function effectively over time, they, they, they don't happen, we've, we've, we've found. And this is where platforms come in. Um, and there's two, two drivers I just want to point to that are really um, pushing us more towards the direction of, of getting these, these platforms setting, set, set, up, set up and functioning well. Um, so the first is, is the international um, picture, which is both the SDGs and the Paris Agreement both call for national multi-stakeholder coordination of some form. So the SDGs have the, the, the voluntary national review process, the Paris Agreement calls for nationally determined contributions towards zero carbon. Neither process works particularly well if it's a government acting in isolation. And at the very least, these processes need some engagement from other stakeholders. So that's one source of impetus for these platforms. Another source is 
the huge and growing number of multi-stakeholder partnerships that we see blossoming everywhere. And I'm sure that, that you've all seen as well in your own contexts. And it's really encouraging to see so much of this activity happening. But perhaps ironically, a lot of that activity is taking place in silos. And platforms can play a really important role in coordinating and connecting all these different forms of activity within particular themes and geographies. And this can add, add real value and also reduce the duplication of effort that can sometimes happen. So there's a really clear need for something that coordinates and catalyzes action from multiple types of stakeholder. So the next question is what types of platforms exist? Um, Twee, if you can share the first slide, please. So in our platforms report, which hopefully uh, you've seen as part of this webinar, we created this simple typology, which is a way to think about or categorize the different forms of multi-stakeholder platform that are, that, are, that are out there. And what you can see with this spectrum, and generally we're talking here about national level platforms as opposed to global ones, is that as you move from left to right, there's a shift from, from dialogue towards action. The potential for impact becomes greater, the job of the platform becomes much more complex and there's exponentially fewer successful examples. And most of the time when people use the word platform, they would like something that's towards the right-hand end of the spectrum, but most of the examples that are out there tend to be much more towards the left-hand end of the spectrum. And this trend was also reflected in the survey that was completed uh, prior to the webinar today. So we're saying that all these different types of platform have their place. But today's session is focused towards the right hand, right hand end of the spectrum, where it's hardest to find good examples, and where we'd argue that most attention and shared learning is needed. So we're looking for transformative platforms that are really working well. They're demonstrating impact in a, in a time scale that's acceptable to funders. There's evidence for why they're working, and there's some degree of rep replicability. So what does it look like when these platforms are working well? Twee, if you can share the next slide, please. Um, We've identified um, eight characteristics, which I'll run through very briefly, and hopefully it provides language that colleagues on the panel can speak to, as well as also build on and improve. So just very briefly, the, the first um, characteristic we've identified is a really dynamic leader. These platforms just don't function without a brilliant leader, ideally a few brilliant leaders who, who, are, who are managing and coordinating these platforms. And I was lucky enough to spend a week in Nairobi uh, when I was preparing this report, really witnessing the first hand the complexity of the work being done by those at the sharp end of delivery. So it's people with the right blend of political and business experience, people with real systems leadership capacity who can really think, lead and act beyond organisational boundaries. And if, if I can spare their blushes, it's people like our moderator and panellists today. The second um, characteristic we identified is strong champions. And by this we mean, as well as these leaders and uh, coordinators and managers who are running the platform on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very important to have senior champions among the platform stakeholders. So that might be high up in government or in the UN or senior business leaders or, or, or um, very well-established leaders in civil society who really understand why the platform exists and who can help to create the, the, the strategic space for it to operate in. Um, the third characteristic is, is what we've termed entrepreneurial management. So these platforms require specialist staff with quite an unusual skill set who know how to speak and work across stakeholder types. So if it's more of a health focused platform, then you, you certainly need to be able to hold your own on the technical side of things. But if you're only a health specialist, then you aren't the right person. You need to have really diverse backgrounds. Experience and innovation is really important. Plus, ideally, experience of the power of partnering to create impact. So these are the kind of quite unique specialist skills required to really run these platforms. Another characteristic we've identified is what we've described as risk tolerant hosts. So sometimes these platforms operate as independent entities, but we found that that can sometimes reduce their organizational clout. So they're often hosted by larger organizations. And again, this could be from government or the UN or from, from other sectors of society. And that organizational host needs to have sufficient belief in the platform to enable it to find its way sometimes over the course of a year or more before it starts demonstrating results. And the host should have a way to capture the learning from the platform so that it can continuously improve over time. So moving on to the next one, we, we have a, a term, uh, what we've termed an adaptable business model. And Tui, again, if you can share the next slide, please. The question of who pays for this multi-stakeholder support infrastructure. What we've identified is this, is this changing profile of funding over time. And this is for a, a national level hosted partnership platform. It, we found that it's really hard to get th things going without enlightened donor support. 
And the time it takes for them to become self-sufficient is probably at least five years. And in that time, you can see that the funding mix really becomes quite diverse from a mix of, of fees from, from the organizations that are part of the platform uh, through to um, support from a local government or a national government. So there's lots of different options within that, but there's diversified forms of funding within those um, within the time it takes to become self-sufficient. And there's also the question of whether becoming self-sufficient is actually what the platform needs to do, or whether it should be an explicitly temporary structure, which then transitions to an existing institution over time. So this all underscores the need to be flexible and adaptable. And Twee, if you can just go back to the other slide, please, uh, on the eight characteristics. Um, which is we found that platforms work really well when there's a diverse network of critical friends to draw on. And this is people for both individual staff members in the form of mentors and coaches, because the work is so complex. And also for the platform itself in, in the form of light touch advisory groups, nothing heavy, not oversight boards, but a group of people that can give strategic input and ask the difficult questions to help keep things on track. Two final points. Uh, one is around strong connectivity. So ideally we found that platforms have a defined theme and geography within which they work. So there definitely needs to be some boundaries around what they do. But of course the SDGs are interconnected. So the platform needs to somehow stay within a defined theme and geography, but also be considering connections to other SDGs. There's also a need to consider connections vertically. So looking at the connections local to international as well. And then finally, there's, a, there's a, a something around the enabling environment, which is that we found that country contexts differ enormously in how much they either support or sometimes even block multi-stakeholder partnering. And I think Hannah will speak a little bit more to this point, but just to say that platforms clearly do better in countries where there's a strong enabling environment for partnering. And we've also found that platforms themselves have a role in advocating for multi-stakeholder approaches at the highest level. Um, Twee, if you can go to the fourth slide, please. I just want to leave you with the extraordinary balancing act that we think that those managing partnerships platforms have to perform. So, Twee, if, uh, so if you go to the final slide, thank you, that's it. It's, it's about being really ambitious and telling a great story, what we've termed shooting for the moon. So these characteristics on the left-hand side, whilst also paying attention to the nuts and bolts, which is the characteristics that you can see on the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, and this is all captured in the report, uh, if you want to spend a bit more time reading it. But for now, um, I'll leave it there and hand to Christy to lead the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, for, for those of you out there um, in the world, if you haven't yet read the report, it's a wonderful read. So so please do. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Christy Davis. Um, I am in Singapore. I am at the Lian Center for Social Innovation, and we are hosted by Singapore Management University. Um, and yes, I, um, I do have some experience uh, giving a, a partnership platform a go, and I learned uh, I, I learned a lot. So it's really a thrill to to be the moderator, not on the hot seat as a as a panelist, but actually to have the pleasure to be a moderator uh, today with four quite amazing people. So for for our for our chat, if I could have my panelists please turn your cameras on because we're going to take a little trip around the world here. So just want to do a quick introduction of each of our four panelists that are joining me for this uh, fireside chat without the fire, I guess I should say. So first we're going to be down in Mexico and Regina Macari is the 2030 Age Agenda Coordinator at the, uh, in Mexico for the government of the Yucatan. Uh, so Regina, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, then we're going to go north to Germany, uh, Hanna Janecek as the Coordinator for European and International Affairs, the German Council for Sustainable Development. Then from Germany, um, over to the continent of Africa in Kenya, where we have Mr. Arif Neki, who is the Senior Advisor for UN Strategic Partnerships at the Resident Coordinator's Office and the National Coordinator of the SDG Partnership Platform in Kenya, and boy, I think you've got the longest title uh, so far, and, and I've only actually just shared part of all of your responsibilities. And then finally, uh, we're gonna circle back around a little bit closer to my part of the world, um, and that is Mr. Uchita Dezoisa in Sri Lanka. He's the Executive Director at the Center for Environment and Development 
at the Sri Lanka Stakeholder SDG platform. So I got to take a breath there. Uh, we've got, so we've got four amazing people here. So with that, actually, I'm going to head back down to uh, Mexico to Regina. And perhaps you could kick us off, just take four or five minutes, if you would, just share about you and your context. Tell us about what's happening in, in the Yucatan, uh, about your platform, um, and just a, a brief a, a brief snapshot of the experience you had in, in, in setting it up, and maybe two or three key successes you've had. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, thank you for much so much for having me today. On behalf of the state of Yucatan and its governor, I would like to thank the team of this webinar for inviting me today. I will give you a slight view of what we have accomplished during the current government in terms of, partner of partnership partnerships for the achievement of the SDGs. First, I would like to take a little bit tour around Yucatan. I will tell you we are a southeast state in Mexico. We're about 2 million, 3,000 people, and we're considered the safest state in Mexico. Actually, our capital media has been awarded the safest city in Latin America. And we, act, and we believe that is because of its people. That's the success of our, our piece. But we're gonna talk about partnerships. And for us to talk about partnerships, we must talk about our, our state council for the 23rd agenda. This council serves as a monitoring and follow-up decision-making body for the accomplishment of the SDG in the state. You can say it's a multi-stakeholder dialogue, knowledge exchange, and reporting platform. Not yet in the action part, but we are we're going, to, going, going to go there. Even though we have a national strategy in Mexico for the implementation of the 2030 agenda, in we, which establishes that every state must have at least one of these multi-stakeholder bodies, it is also true that not every state has the same structure. And I'm proud to say that Yucatan has one of the most inclusive, active, and committed councils in the country. The legal foundation of this council is a governmental decree, which states the function, rep responsibility, spectrums, and establishes mem its members, which, which are state offices, municipal governments, universities, civil society organizations, business chambers, and our National Institute for Statistics and Geography. They get together two times a year to review and follow up the fulfillment of the SDGs. However, the backbone of, the, of this council and the, and the success of the same lies in three aspects mainly, and I will go like briefly around each one of them. First, the multi-stakeholder committees. We like to call them the arms of our council. These are like the operative platforms, five operative platforms that gather diverse stakeholders and in active reunions to create synergies and collaborative bonding among each other. We have, three, we have three specialized in social, economic, and environmental. We have a regional one, which links the, the efforts with the local governments and the young people. And we have a technical one that uh, is in charge of following up and monitoring the progress of the other committees and also provides technical advice and training to the members who require it. Something very particular, particular of these specialist committees is that they are chaired by a civil society organization, not a government office which make them trans-governmental, if you want to say it that way. Uh, we host a total of 16 civil society, or civil society organizations, nine academic institu institutions, eight local governments, seven university students, which is really, uh, really uh, great because we have the voice of young people, and 20 state offices. This bonding has proved very important during the pandemic. Like really having a multi-stakeholder platform allows initiatives, like a great initiatives to, to be created um, and, and, for, and, and join efforts during these hard times. Then we have the annual work plans. As a government, we have to create annual work plans that serve as our guide for our actions every year to establish objectives, goals, budget, beneficiaries, indicators. And this, every one of these activities is aligned to at least one SDG. One of the first tasks as coordination, as, the, as, as coordinator was to engage all members of society of the committees, whether they're from public or private sector to do the same. This allowed a uniform format for everyone, making it easier to do the follow-up and to monitor the activities. 
Through this annual work plan, they establish and set the goals to be achieved, not only by them and their organizations, but also as a committee. And then we have the monitoring and accounting process. These, these activities, as I are aligned directly and indirectly to at least one SDG and one goal, an indicator for the 2030 agenda and also a state indicator, which is, um, it was a process made by the state in which we kind of like bring to the local uh, sphere the, the uh, international uh, indicators and say, okay, Yucatan impacts in this indicator this way. So that, that way every member, when they report periodically, they're advancing the targets, this, uh, this advance is registered into our, our indicator board for the 2030 agenda, where the progress can be visualized and, and can be measured, evaluated, and can use that information as uh, in decision-making situations. One of the main challenges uh, first was, uh, despite the success in mobilizing and coordinator, mm. uh, there, there's continuing to be a lot of resistance uh, from some members, especially uh, the business part, because politically speaking, they depend a lot in how well they get with the government. Um, yeah. Then we need greater yeah. awareness and um, we need to involve the local government because local government, state local government are like are separate powers. Right. So, Gina, let me just, can I just stop you there for a second? Because yes. we're actually, I do want to hear more about the challenges, um, okay. but I want to save that for a moment. Because um, you've got you've, you've actually got a, a really interesting and quite innovative uh, model, um, and that's it's clearly been quite successful. So can I just can I stop you there for a moment and save save the challenges, which is always so interesting for all of us? Cool. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm just going to travel from Mexico now up to Germany, and Hannah, perhaps you could just introduce um, your platform and a couple of of the successes and basically how you set it up. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, it's a deep honor to be part of such a distinguished panel. Um, and I already learned quite a lot um, from Regina. Um, yes, I'm Hannah Janicek, the coordinator at the German Council for Sustainable Development for International Questions. Um, so here I coordinate the international partners of RNE, RNE is the short version, as well as the working group within the Council on European and International Governance Questions. I think the, the Global Sustainable Development Report in 2019 has illustrated once more very impressively um, that we can address um, yeah, the complex challenges of sustainable development effectively only through coherent and interlinked action. Um, and as we are at crossroads for this transformational change in all our societies, I think multi-stakeholder councils like RNE um, can provide a very um, supportive platform to navigate through these complex decision making and and pathways for transformation. Um, so what do I need? What do I, what do I mean by complex pathways? So um, in Germany, we, for example, decided to embark on transition our entire energy system. Um, it's under discussion to change the mobility, um, but it's also the agriculture system that needs to, to shift actually towards sustainable pathways. So this requires really deep long term changes for many stakeholders in Germany. Um, and all these stakeholders have vested interests for a very good reason. Um, and that is where RNE as a multi-stakeholder council actually provides a value added. So it's a body um, that provides recommendations and opinions to the German government um, on these transitional topics. So RNE is a multi-stakeholder council um, that um, aims to build consensus uh, on contested issues. Um, and aims for practical solutions and inclusive um, pathways. The council consists of 15 eminent members from society. So from civil society, academia, politics and, um, and private sector. And the, the council is mandated to um, advise and provide recommendations to the national German development uh, strategy for sustainable development. Um, and to also, um, yeah, create concrete action and innovative programs for implementation on sustainable development and make sustainability a public um, issue of vital importance. Um, so based on this diverse composition um, of the different stakeholders in RNE, 
Um, it is a platform that aims to, to represent these different interests and tries to negotiate across these um, critical issues. So um, I think in general, it holds the potential to, um, to identify the difficult um, issues and also to negotiate. Um, it is the aim to, to not reach a minimal consensus, but that is the risk at a, in a multi-stakeholder um, platform. Um, but it also aims to really provide solutions that are socially accepted. Because if we face rejection of sustainable development um, pathways, uh, we will not end anywhere. So it's really sort of aiming to provide a compass to navigate through these complex decision making processes and also aims to have the long term perspective in mind, um, which sometimes um, is lagging behind. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, in the past year the RNE has been quite busy and quite challenged to be honest um, because there, a lot of the uh, critical topics have actually emerged um, through the COVID pandemic, but um, but they have been there before and as well. But I think that has changed the game a bit. Um, so we have intensively worked on food systems. We really looked into the different trends of indicators in food systems in Germany and also the international implications of the German food system. Um, we've worked on hydrogen as one of the components of the energy transition. Um, yes, and we are also working on carbon neutrality at the moment, which is also a very complex pathway to take. So it's, it's a quite rewarding work. Um, and I think it can provide a value added to governments, um, the work we do. Um, yeah. I maybe leave it here and then we can <laughs> dig deeper in the discussion. Wonderful. Oh, my goodness. Great. Thank you. That's a great introduction. Thank you, Hannah, so much. OK, from Germany, we're going to head over to Africa. So Arif, you've uh, you've done a heck of a lot of really interesting things there in Kenya. So why don't you tell us about about uh, about Kenya and the different platforms and the work that you do? Thanks. Right, thank you, uh, Christy, and uh, um, a, a pleasure and a, a delight to, to be invited to speak on this uh, uh, eminent panel. Thank you so much. Um, as many of you will know, Kenya is a, a lower middle income country. Um, we have a, a very young population. Uh, the average age in Kenya, as it is in Africa, is about 19, which is uh, you know, far lower than what you see in, uh, in other continents. And uh, so we have a very special profile and characteristic, uh, what we might call the potential for a demographic dividend that we need to reap. Um, essentially, 30 years to get rich before we get old, is, uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the population stats in the economy. Um, we have, uh, um, you know, had about 6 7% year on year GDP growth. So, you know, seen as in many ways a success narrative one of the countries in Africa that's generally the first in doing a lot of things, uh, um, but uh, uh, what oftentimes masks uh, these lovely G, uh, GDP numbers is that, you know, we had uh, about 40% uh, of population, about 50 million people uh, below the poverty line, even prior to the, uh, the COVID pandemic. So, you know, we really need to understand the, the dynamics, the uh, issues of uh, equity and the issues of, uh, you know, uh, walking the talk on leaving no one behind. Um, so one of the uh, very exciting opportunities was for us to partner with government and co-create this unique SDG partnership platform in Kenya, which is co-chaired and co-created between the government and the UN system in Kenya, and actually brings in multi-stakeholders from the private sector, from philanthropy, from development partners, bilaterals, multilaterals, and others. Um, and uh, it's been a very exciting initiative, as I mentioned, uh, modeled along four clusters of SDGs. Um, we started with the primary healthcare cluster. Um, given that secondary and tertiary healthcare was something we 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 needed to avoid uh, when you look at looking at being a middle income country, you want to look at early detection, promotive, preventive health. We can't quite afford to get the population to PET scans and CAT scans in tertiary settings, so we really need to address this. Um, and uh, we've now opened the food and nutrition security window, which is also very exciting and close to opening a manufacturing and skills training window and, and affordable housing. So in terms of the context, uh, um, one of the things for us to think about is uh, middle income countries that uh, see this transition from aid to trade with ODA shrinking. 
with 57 years since independence of, uh, you know, a strong dependence, particularly uh, NGOs, CBOs, community-based groups on grant funding. And, and all of a sudden the writing being on the wall that, you know, uh, we're now seeing uh, donors moving from aid to trade. So how do we start thinking about the UN reform that uh, the Secretary General has been uh, uh, advocating on the transition from SDG funding to financing? And um, the very important issue of convergence, making sure that we don't have gaps, duplication, replication, and the like. And this came out very clearly in the EDIS conference prior to the adoption of the SDGs. So um, within that context, we were able to um, have a number of what I call the dog and pony show. We had three World Economic Forum events, Davos, Rwanda, Durban, uh, UN General Assembly side events, all jointly with the government of Kenya and global leaders to moot the idea of creating a partnership platform of this kind. And to, um, uh, uh, to um, the comment from the Kenya government when they launched it in September 2017 at the General Assembly, that uh, you always hear pledges of partnerships and SDG 17 in almost every conference. But where is that concrete ecosystem that can get a private sector partner, a blended finance partner, a UN agency, a county government, and an entrepreneur to come together around concrete investments um, that go beyond short-term political and fiscal cycles, because that tends to be the other issue. Every five years, you have a change of government, you have uh, all types of uh, interruptions in the, the momentum of impacts that you're trying to create. So um, if you look at the fiscal space in countries like Kenya, we have been heavily overburdened with debt. And uh, you're looking at probably two or three generations having to repay the debt that currently exists. Um, very little of our development funding actually is able to go to development. Uh, you know, it's, it's below 20%. Uh, the rest is debt service and recurrent salaries. So really the impetus is to say, where are the other pools of capital that can help us uh, to meet our development aspirations? And so private sector capital becomes much more attractive, but you know, hitherto having worked in silos between private sector development partners, NGOs and the like, how do we perforate these silos and how do we actually get, as I say, how do we drop our egos, logos and converge for impact? And that's where I think the platform has been able to fill a particular gap. Um, the fact that uh, we have uh, you know, private sector partners who've been on the continent oftentimes 50 or 100 years, seeing value on being on a platform shows that this also becomes a bit of a de-risking mechanism purely by our, our moral authority of convening, connecting and catalyzing partnerships as a UN, but also in terms of uh, looking at some other uh, instruments and tools for, for de-risking. We have uh, also created a, a multi-partner trust fund in New York, which has been extremely helpful because that has allowed us also to pull together supports for the sustainance of the platform itself. And as we've done that, partners have come in. We have private sector partners who've joined us, uh, uh, Philips, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Work for Mothers, Huawei, a number of private safari com. A number of partners have joined us, but so have bilaterals. Uh, the Netherlands government was the first to jump in. We've got uh, the US government. We have uh, uh, Switzerland uh, and uh, a number of other bilaterals coming on board, as well as the World Bank through GFF. But it has a very strong entrepreneurial sort of private sector feel about the discussion because the discussion is really about how do we unlock concrete investment pipelines on the ground, which is the legacy you can leave behind beyond these short-term political cycles. And uh, um, in the last uh, approximately three years of our existence, uh, we've been operating one window, the primary healthcare window, uh, where we've created about $165 million of uh, pipeline investments in primary healthcare at various levels of maturity. We had a study with McKinsey funded by USAID that identified um, the uh, market potential for private investments. Um, you oftentimes find that there is a, a you know, understandable um, caution or even cynicism about investments in primary healthcare because it, it's, it's what hitherto wasn't very bankable. Um, but now with big data, innovation and technology, and, and we have very strong links between what we call the Silicon uh, Savannah and the Silicon Valley and a number of Silicon Valley partners work with us. We've been able to identify $10 billion of 
primary sector, primary healthcare investments potential in the next 10 years. And that has helped us identify deal sizes, margins and opportunities for, for, for private sector partnerships and often PPPs. So as we've done that, uh, one of the other important things for us has been to also see how the platform has helped us bring a very strong uh, field of uh, UN agencies. Kenya has been one of the larger um, footprints of the UN with 23 UN agencies, funds and programs, including two global head offices, UN Habitat and, uh, and UNEP, to also come together uh, much more as a sort of one UN delivering as one uh, uh, mechanism. And um, we've uh, been able to, through the platform, create associated platforms and networks with private sector. So we have an agriculture sector network that we've co-created with over hundred business membership organizations, cutting across value chains in crops, uh, um, uh, uh, livestock and aquaculture. We've also created a, a national advisory board for impact finance task force, which is uh, an initiative that the GSG has been supporting in about 30 countries. And currently I chair the NAB task force in Kenya, where we have the Kenya Bankers Association, the Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance, the uh, uh, private equity and venture capital association, pensions, cooperatives, uh, yeah. angel investors, social enterprises. So that financing continuum also tended to be in silos and, and this has helped to bring everyone together. Yeah. So you now have a pool of partners who are actually looking for deal flow. Yeah. And then yeah. you have 47 county governments who are bringing up exciting ideas about project investments, but often don't have the transactional advisory and transactional uh, facility to bring these projects to maturity and become uh, sort of bankable, so to speak. Right. And the other I think, very important uh, link was that we launched an SDG Accelerator Lab in September 2019, uh, in partnership with uh, Berkeley and Stanford and, and our Silicon Valley partners mm. at the Rockefeller Foundation, which has allowed us also to think about those innovations that are proven, but oftentimes don't get to scale, yeah. uh, where we can get behind them in terms of sort of ecosystem players. Mm -hmm. So you've got the private capital, you've got the innovation, you've got the investors, you've got the UN partners in development, and you're co-chaired with government. So we become a, 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 a nice sort of a, a mix of ingredients to cook mm -hmm. this SDG lasagna, so to speak, because you really need all these elements to come together. Yeah. Let me stop uh, there and then be happy to uh, carry on. Yeah, I'm, I'm also, I'm just struck at the complexity of it at the same time. Um, I've got some follow-up questions for you, Reef, so that'll, I'll look forward to that. Just thinking about the different interests of the different stakeholders, but that's yeah. that's true in any platform. So, okay, so let's, let's take one more stop um, in uh, Sri Lanka. So Uchita, please um, tell us a little bit about your part of the world and your platform. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Christy. And I must confess that my story and the platform story in Sri Lanka is completely different to what I heard from Arif. Um, I must tell you that the background and the inspiration comes from, I was part of the steering committee in 1992. The first Earth Summit, uh, people's, uh, the, the NGO, International NGO Steering Committee, which we came up with uh, uh, the NGO treaties, the global NGO treaties. And then in 2012, uh, the People's Sustainability Treaties was initiated by me. We brought over 300 groups and 14 People's Treaties. Now in 2016 and 17, I was the uh, Sustainable Development Advice appointed by the cabinet in the country and the chief negotiator for the uh, HLPF and the regional uh, SDG process. Now, why I'm saying this is that the first thing that we did in Sri Lanka in 2016, when we started the process early as in February 2016, was to establish a sustainable development engagement platform. An engagement platform meant that this process will not be run solely by government, will not be determined by government alone. It will be designed and it will be implemented by all stakeholders, including local government, uh, and the design process of the mapping that we had done in 2016 of 425 central government institutions, their roles against 169 targets, and then the stakeholders uh, is one of the first in the world uh, on institutional coherence mapping that we did. Now, the, the story of in, uh, Sri Lanka being one of the best planning countries uh, didn't continue. In 2018, uh, early when I left, the process started crumbling down due to not political, to be honest, it was a huge bureaucratic process that dumped 
uh, and also influenced by uh, funded projects, the, uh, the very narrow uh, focus on uh, thematic funded projects uh, and the opportunities there. Now, today Sri Lanka does not have a roadmap. Sri Lanka does not have a policy or a strategy. Sri Lanka does not have a financing mechanism at the um, national level. What we did was in 2018, because the uh, NDC, pro, the VNR process was not good enough, uh, not inclusive enough, we created, unfortunately, we had to establish a Sri Lanka stakeholder SDG platform. Now, in, I still believe that it should not be a platform uh, out of government or within government. I think it's an, it must be an all inclusive uh, platform. And that is what we have created. From day one, because there was no inclusive process in the country, uh, we have had seriously good government official higher up support from the finance commission chair to the provincial councils, to the local governments, to the central bank uh, governance, and all of them had participated in this process. But there has been pressure from the beginning for civil society led, civil society controlled processes. Now, a platform cannot be that. There is a, that the fragmentation is a huge challenge between all within and between all sectors. And that is something that we have tried hard. The platform was designed on three main objectives. First one is to have inclusive transformation. What it means that an inclusive transformation should not exclude um, anyone and should not be uh, exclusive. Uh, so we have all types of uh, organizations where people participating from CSOs to business associations to uh, local governments uh, to uh, academia and so and so forth. This is not a membership driven one. It is about creating a single platform for everybody to converge, to dialogue particularly, and then lead towards collaboration and partnership. Now, the second main objective and the driving objective for us is to conduct an independent monitoring uh, uh, evaluation and a review mechanism in the country because we don't have one. The status reports that are coming into the HLPF are not trustworthy at the moment. These are not content-driven, research-driven, scientific, methodology-driven. That is what we are doing. We have created the first ever voluntary people's review, and that is being modeled across in the world. The people's school card is part of that, and there are other countries taking up. It is driven by day in, day out, uh, researching of data in a, in a country and a world which says there's no data. We believe there's a data democracy problem rather than lack of data and a lack of methodological approach towards analyzing and coming out. So that we do. Now, what we have also done is create a, a sustainable uh, SDG transformation lab because we believe it is not easy for everybody to spend time on, on the transformative action that is required. But one of the most important actions that is leading from the platform is creating very important partnerships. In 2019, 2020, two of our organizations, my one and another organization called Janata Action, were supported from a global call from Germany, GIZ 2030 Transformation Fund. And we proposed to uh, as, uh, uh, develop, formulate, and build capacity in Sri Lanka on a domestic resource mobilization framework. We, we believe that the current discussion on financial mechanics and mechanisms that are being promoted alone will not transform the world and will not help transformative process. We believe resources have to be thought from a very broad perspective and for that, we need to have recalibrating the context that the SDGs are being implemented in the world. In Sri Lanka, we identify that the policy context where policy uh, coherence is completely missing needs to be recalibrated. Secondly, we believe that the localizing context needs to be recalibrated. Thirdly, we believe that the financing context needs to be recalibrated. And fourthly, the transformation or the transformative context itself needs to be recalibrated. Now, in recalibrating, you need to do two, three, three other things as well. Number one, you need to be reimagining. You can't be sitting in old policy uh, for plat platforms and frameworks and try to develop 
transformative policy uh, policies. Secondly, is that you can't sit in institutional structures which are totally fragmented in Sri Lanka, particularly, and many countries like that who do not work with each other. Those on sustainable development work on sustainable development, those on climate work on climate, which is extremely funny to see at the end of the day. But then the bigger ones, economics and environment and social policies are not convergent and they're contradictory and conflicting. So that is what we have been doing. So the, the, the framework is out. Let me give you an update as to where we are heading very quickly. As I said, we believe that partnerships must be multi-stakeholder, multi-dimensional, and must bring in all different parties together for a transformation. We have signed up in January a partnership MOU between my organization and the Marine Environment Protection Agency in Sri Lanka to do critically two things. One is to establish and manage a national coordination mechanism for SDG 14 in Sri Lanka. So what we are doing in the platform for independent monitoring review and analysis and review is now coming into the main one. And we have picked SDG 14, which is one of the hard ones and one of the most important ones for resource mobilization as well. Second is to establish and manage an integrated sustainable ocean resource coordination mechanism to take the process from simply monitoring and reporting into transformative action. Let me give you a second one. We are di discussing with the leading chambers in the country of Sri Lanka, which has a massive outreach, particularly to the larger uh, entities in the private sector. Uh, and we want, we, they have asked us to work together and play a key role not just in uh, partnerships with single organization or several organizations, but inside the platform. Now, that is a big uh, step for us. The transformation that we look at is, is an, in another way. I don't think, I, we believe that just people like us from gener uh, one generation needs to hand over the baton. The leadership must be with the younger generation. And we have already established the leadership going and the, particularly the management of the platform going to young people already being appointed. For that, uh, to make sure that the correct youth comes, a youth platform is being mooted. Mm -hmm. And one of the most marginalized, dropped out, the gender, we are talking on that. And we are looking at local government as well. Mm -hmm. I will not get into the uh, 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 challenges because I believe that you are going to bring to me yeah. The challenges yeah. are extremely great. And uh, Christy, I would love to come back and talk about the challenges as well. I and will make you sure so you have a moment to do that. <laughs> so thank you, Chita. I love your passion. It's wonderful. OK, so I know everybody's. Uh, thank you so much for those snapshots. Very, very simple. So many similarities and so many differences. And I'm, of course, just the complexity of what each of you are are, are working within, um, it's it's just, it, uh, it's, it's striking. So with that though, in the midst of complexity, of course, is inherent challenge. And that's something I know everybody's dying to, 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 to talk about, but also um, people wanna hear about that. So it's not just putting a challenge or two out there, which Regina, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start back with you because you've waited, you've waited so patiently as we've been kind of uh, flying around the world. But could I ask um, just in the, in the interest of time, because we've got some other things we'd really like to focus on on. Could you just give me give me one, you know, give me one really big meaty challenge and what you are doing to mitigate it. Um, and so that way we can talk about a couple of other things. So Regina, over to you. Thank you, Christy. Yes, of course. I think like the main challenge will be that the resistance that comes from uh, from some members, I believe, uh, which you talk, talk, talked about that, like uh, how the it depends about the government and how well the, those actors um, are are getting along with the government in that in that in that particular time of, of of period of time. So that is one thing. And the trust to trust the government was a really really great challenge because I come from a government and I and I I felt that I had to do this negotiation with them and prove them that we are all together in this. So how are we doing? How are we going doing uh, to mitigate it? Well, basically, um, well, talk like get, uh, getting uh, awareness and some communication with them, and always be open to talk to them, 
to pass along their concerns and to work with them with their main uh, um, preoccupations, basically. Yeah. Did you, can I ask you just one follow up question? Did you find that trust in the government, but was it was it, did it go the other way as well? How did government feel, say, about working with civil society, for example? Actually, the government of Yucatan, and that's one of the greatest things of our state, we are really close uh, society. We're a very supportive society. So for the 23rd agenda, we already work along in different and various like, councils and projects, especially concerning security. So we all have to work with each other. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Regina. Actually, I'm just I'm going to pop up to Arif. Actually, you're just on sitting on top of Regina on my screen. So, uh, what's what's one really big meaty challenge, uh, and how have you been mitigating it? Uh, thank you, um, Christy. Um, no, I think one of the the, the big ones really is um, what I might term um, inertia. Um, we come from decades of uh, silos. We have private sector philanthropy, blended finance partners, UN development partners, government, you know, very traditionally used to working in their silos. All of a sudden you have this, you know, wonderful idea about creating a platform and bringing everyone together. Um, but the, the, the issue is uh, um, that, uh, you know, and this includes uh, development partners in the UN itself as well. How do you bring a culture change across this group that this is not about competition. This is not about branding your logo. This is not about creating your own fragmented initiative. This is not about competing for resources, but this is really about, about convergence. And uh, one of the approaches really is just to say that, look folks, um, this is not about some kind of CSR or, or, or charity or, or philanthropy on the side. This is about your core, uh, 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 your core, um, what I might say, enlightened self-interest. Mm. For private sector, it's the future markets in Africa for the next 50 or 100 years, because Africa will be the, that group of, you know, 3 billion consumers within a few decades. Mm. For, uh, for, for philanthropy, it's about leveraging your, your grants and your funding across a whole chain of blended finance partners who can then scale this up much more than your initial uh, pilot seed funding. For government, it's about you know, making things happen in society where it's clearly private sector that's the engine of development. Mm -hmm. So for every sector, there is an enlightened self-interest yeah. and the, the challenge is to, to keep reminding them about that enlightened self-interest and the, the opportunities for convergence, which create greater wins for everyone in the long run. Yeah. Um, and uh, what, remind, what, what I get reminded of oftentimes is that one can have a great strategy around bringing people together. But at the end of the day, um, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. Mm. So how do we make sure that culture change happens on the ground to actually mm. bring people together and, and mm. to feel that they're actually getting greater value? Yeah, um, I think that would be one big one for me. There are many others, but I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, I, after after I want to ask Uchita next, and then Hannah, but then actually, I think this whole point about the in, you know interests, you know, the competing interests, and how do you overcome that when you're saying it, it is about convergence? Um, but that's quite a arduous um, process, especially if there is inertia, simply because. We're, we're all, it changes hard, right? And so, um, so Uchita, I'm gonna, you were nodding, you were nodding vigorously as, as Arif was speaking. So I'm yeah. just gonna go to you uh, first and then over to Hannah. Well, um, obviously I find, uh, 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 you know, convergence with what Arif is saying. The, the, everything uh, leads to, leads from a point of fragmentation, mindset of silos and comfort zone. Uh, and because of that, what happens is that uh, everything goes into the partnerships are becoming my little partnerships where the comfort zone is. No one is challenging you. You, you make sure that the controversial platforms are left to do their controversies and the transformations. And you do little, little projects which can be blown up by a lot of money. And the platforms are not being supported if not for the platform being innovative. And what we have done is being very careful not to sell ourselves into that. It has been extremely hard and the, it does not come from one single entity, but the load, the lot of money that has come into SDGs have been for tamashas. 
has been for branding, has been for telling, uh, 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 you know, a loud trumpet. But then it's a, it's a, it's, there's a whole heap of patience and guidance and hand holding and convincing in this game that has to go. You simply need to be able to sit with the different groups and then talk to them, guide them through, make them feel comfortable. That is what, and it doesn't happen uh, just because a platform is in a country. It's a matter of identifying who the key players from different stakeholders are, giving them the front line when it is required. You don't need to play a leadership all the time. You need to have people who are good at that, their craft of public relations to do that. You are good at people who are good at steering uh, the pot. And yeah. then you are good at creating the soup. You need to figure out people, how do you put everything together? And that has taken time, that will take time. Till then, we have to hold forth, but at the same time, you have to bring in the key persons, the pillars, the drivers, the institutions together. And we, we, are, we are hopeful, very hopeful. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super high touch, isn't it? Yeah, so Hannah, how would you, uh, how would you characterize uh, your biggest challenge there in Germany, and perhaps you want to respond to any of this that you've already heard. Yeah, thank you for the, the good insights. Um, maybe institutionally regarding R&E, I have to admit that we are in a very fortunate situation. Like the German Council for Sustainable Development has been called into being in 2001. So it is in existence now for, for almost 20 years, which is quite, quite a long period. And I think it uh, proves that there is a value added of the work the council does for the German government. Um, but turning through the challenges, I do see also two main challenges that have been mentioned by the colleagues um, here from the panel. I think the first one is at the moment, we are in Germany revisioning the German uh, strategy for sustainable development. Um, we are expecting to have the new version in a few weeks from now. Um, and I think here we notice that we also lag behind um, when we speak about moving from monitoring to action, actually, because we have a very um, diversified and good system of measuring um, trends towards improvement of sustainable development, but linking it to measures and actions um, that I think needs to, to be strengthened in the German strategy. And that's also leads me to the second challenge is really to implement it at the local level, sustainable development, like really getting it on the road. That is mm. so challenging um, that um, I think that's, that's something that connects all of us. And um, I think that remains the largest challenge in the, in the coming years also, because yeah, it needs to, it requires to get on board all the stakeholders uh, in society. Um, and here, I think a council like r &E can advise the German government and provide opinions, um, but this is still far away from, from implementing um, local implementation and delivery of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So actually, this leads me really nicely into kind of a next question that I'm gonna actually, uh, we're going to open up open it up uh, to everyone here, but let me just uh, read it out. So this is um, something from the report, the Partnership uh, Platforms for SDG publication that Dave mentioned. So in the publication, it, it discusses the importance of systems leadership, people who catalyze collective leadership. So all of you are, I mean, what you all are describing, it requires amazing leadership. Who are these people in your country and how do they persevere and thrive to foster and spark collective action and social innovation. So everyone out there, the catalysts, the catalysts in your country who spark collective action, who, who persevere and they thrive to foster social innovation. Who are they? What sectors do they come from? I'm just curious to see what we've got out there just to give us a sense. Um, because then I'm going to, I mean, actually all of the panelists, you've touched on that a bit, but I would say, do you, is there a real champion um, or is it really a mix? Do you find that you have a good mix of systems leadership across your sectors, across the different stakeholder groups um, in your platforms? Um, I don't know, Uchita, you were talking about, you know, that just that you're just, it, it's a very high, to, you know, you're, you're out there kind of grabbing people by the collar and shaking them, it sounds like. Um, just as the numbers come in here, what would you, how would you answer this? Very interesting uh, to answer that. Uh, it's a very interesting landscape in Sri Lanka. 
very uh, surprisingly, the in initial impetus came from the public sector, the government, because the government at that time appointed for the first time a cabinet ministry on sustainable development. And some of us had the opportunity of coming into a space where the government sector does, does not understand how to do and design it with loads of engagement. But the moment that it, it got into the hands of bureaucratic control, the process started getting controlled and being dropped. Now, the usual guardians of sustainable development has been civil society in the broader context of terms of it. Now, I think civil society has struggled tremendously in the interlinkages, understanding the interlinkages and the multi-dimensional aspects of transformation. And in that sense, the problem has been that the lack of knowledge growth in the academia. Now, the academia normally would help come into the uh, research space, through the research space to the civil society and guide that. Today, we have not found that. So some of us have to continue doing certain things. And there are colleagues in the world. I've known Hannah's work, and she has known my work as well. And we, we, we check our work. And that has to come to each of our countries. It cannot stay in our countries. But then the private sector, the private sector has a hard time in all this because the private sector is used to ticking boxes and saying working on profit pillars, profit centers. But the chambers are slowly coming into it. And the chambers are learning the technicalities and the technical uh, wording of this. That is our role to guide them. So to me, I think it changes. In fact, there are local governments who are championing, but they have limited support from the central government. So yeah. to me, at the moment, the champions are scattered and it is looking for an opportunity to converge. And the leaders are not just coming from one sector. Yeah. And that is good. Yeah. But at the same time, it must spread through the different sectors and come in. But yeah. I think that's a huge role that we all have to play together. Yeah. So I know, Regina, you're nodding. Um, and just actually, Regina, before I, I ask you to chime in here, there's just been some chats saying, hey, this is a limited poll. There's others that are not on this list. So absolutely, if you've got another answer, put it in the chat. We'd love to see and we'd love to hear who else are the catalysts in your country. So by all means, um, if your answer's not here, stick it in the chat. Um, but Regina, did you have a did you have a, a comment to make from from uh, Yucatan on this? Yes. I actually agree with everything Uchita just said. Like I basically can like copy paste the, his comment. But yeah, the thing is, we also believe that the catalyst was the go local governments. But actually, as we uh, actually getting to know the, the agenda and try to implement it in the state and gather all these actors, we actually found out that the civil society organization have been working with the agenda way before us. So we were like really pleased, like please surprised to see that we weren't to, like we weren't going to uh, teach them to, or, 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 or help them more than they have they helping us. So yeah, I think local governments, because the agenda, even though it's a global agenda, it has to be accomplished at local level. Mm. It has to be from every single one of us, and especially like the local governments are the ones that are closest to the people and the ones that, I mean, have more money than civil society organizations. So they can fund the, the, the 23rd agenda. But the civil society organizations, they're not, bind by any uh, restrictions or laws or administrative regulation as the government. So they're more freely to work. Mm. So that combination is really, really uh, great. And that I think is one of the key, the keys of success. Mm. So, yeah. so, so actually then Hannah, you had also mentioned, um, thanks Regina about local level sustainable development. Um, is what Regina is saying, does that resonate with you? Absolutely, yeah. I think what we observe in Germany, like for decades now, the champions have really been the civil society organizations at local level, as well as academia. I think they are the two stakeholder groups that have really driven sustainable development. And what we observe now um, rather lately, and I think that is a very important um, observation is that the private sector now also calls for 
for regulation towards sustainable development and uh, requires this to sort of yeah plan ahead of of their um, productive areas um, mm -hmm. and the second one are local communities and cities um, that's what we are observing as well and I think here the SDGs and the 2030 agenda created momentum at an international level for for local level to really um, move ahead with um, yeah developing mm -hmm. sustainable development strategies at urban level aiming for for local and international reporting aiming to reach out to citizens in communities and cities and i think these mm. are two developments that are very important uh in the coming years so actually can i just feed into that arif i'm coming back over to you but it's really actually now now let's layer on let's lay over the fact that we're just coming through a pandemic so we've got a, a quite uh for for most of us i would say um this has been quite Quite a, quite a last year. Um, and so has your perspective on multi-sector or multi-stakeholder partnerships, has it really changed given the unique time that we've just, actually that we're still in? Um, how, how has it changed for you? And is there a silver lining to be had? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, actually, I think we were fortunate to have had a couple of years uh, a head start in creating this sort of multi-stakeholder architecture on the ground. Yeah. And and the, uh, the the critical issue of, of deeper trust that 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 we need to to develop over the years. So as soon as the COVID uh, um, uh, um, pandemic hit us, on the day we identified the first COVID uh, infected person in Kenya, um, we launched the National Business Compact for COVID, and um, we created a consortium with private sector and NGO partners. We created a flexi fund and we were able to very quickly mobilize cash and in-kind supports for critical gaps that the Ministry of Health was looking for, even as simple as PPEs and ventilators and yeah. fuel in, 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 in cars to, to transport health healthcare workers to remote locations, yeah. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that has, uh, that has been really uh, very well appreciated by government. So it's, it's yeah. actually created a, a virtuous circle of, uh, of yeah. greater trust and partnerships. And overall, um, we also uh, contributed to the UN's flash fund of $267 million that was created with Ocha mm -hmm. and others in the leadership. But one thing that uh, was very useful was we were able to place about five uh, of our platform staff in various parts of government, in critical areas in national government, PPP units, uh, health units, mm -hmm. uh, remote uh, county level locations. And so that allowed us to create a bit of a, a network or an architecture of, of insiders that worked very closely with government and provided support. Yeah. And we yeah. were able to um, also, I think, uh, anticipate where the key gaps were in, for example, in agriculture, we created a six month rapid response initiative across yeah. the agriculture sector network, because we were hugely concerned about, you know, young people, particularly and women being laid off on in jobs uh, around SMEs in agricultural value chains. Mm. And so how we could create key interventions to try and protect many of those jobs. So this mm. balance between saving lives and livelihoods was something very real and, 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 and it, it affected a, a huge amount of young people particularly. Mm. And the shift to digitization and the scaling up of innovations was the other piece. So mm. yeah, I think, I think uh, in many ways, we were fortunate that we, we had started the platform a couple of years earlier. And the silver lining is that there is now an even greater appetite to work together. I think there's this, yeah. this realization that, mm. that we're all, we're all uh, um, vulnerable. We, we, you know, no one has a silver bullet. Mm. And, and despite uh, who you are or how large your company is or how large your organization is, we really need to work together. So it's in a way, it's, it's cemented that... Uh, that culture of uh, coming together. Yeah, and I think uh, for us, it's very important that um, we are now able to follow what the Secretary General had described as uh, creating systematic linkages and platforms mm -hmm. with private sector and other, other sectors. Mm -hmm. So we move from the transactional and the opportunistic mm -hmm. to the more deeper partnerships that we need to have. Mm -hmm. And this is not about for example, traditional ways of fundraising where a development partner would invite 50 private sector partners for lunch and then ask them to open their checkbooks at dessert. This is more about 
really thinking through and co-creating solutions. So mm. it's uh, I think it's created a, a much stronger sense of solidarity. And it's also created opportunities for us to unlock investment pipelines in local manufacturing, for example. We have a $45 million local vaccine manufacturing initiative that's happening. We've got mm. other um, very interesting initiatives in uh, agro food processing and the like, which yeah. has stirred up uh, a great appetite for, for local partners to come together. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, I'm just gonna, Uchita, you've been uh, nodding your head. I think Regina, you as well, but do you, uh, are you of the same sentiment as Arif on that? What, uh, I'm just curious how your perspective on, on multi-sector, on multi-stakeholder partnerships has shifted or changed as a result of the pandemic. Uh, Regina, would you want to go before me? Okay. Um, I think it's a massive learning curve, I think, on Earth. I think um, the SDGs uh, initially, uh, the complexity of the SDGs, uh, the, 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 the need for greater comprehension that all issues in the world are interlinked and that the solutions need to be found there. And siloed based uh, fragmented solutions are no longer and the vulnerabilities are common as Arif said. I think this is one of the things I think where Hana is also saying uh, the private sector uh, is the under, uh, gaining their understanding not doesn't mean that they are, they are responding to the pace of understanding. Uh, it takes time. Uh, but I think there, there, there are still uh, barriers uh, psychological barriers, mostly of the mindset of uh, being fragmented in our own comfort zones. Mm -hmm. But then uh, how you reach out, and I think, I, I firmly believe that the segmentation uh, the lines have changed a lot, has thinned between civil society, enterprise, public sector. Uh, we have all have been moving uh, across these thin lines because we feel that if you want transformation, you simply cannot be branded and caged in one zone. You must transcend zones. And that is the whole thing of transformation. And if as thought leaders, you can't transcend, then you are preaching something else. You are, you, you are not preaching the transformation. So mm -hmm. I think it is extremely important that we be patient to those who are holding on to old pillars. Um, but at the same time, uh, you must also try to weave this whole thread, this carpet together and connecting the dots and making sure that some of the dots don't just become bubbles and burst but you need to hold them to size and mm. keep them uh, in real, real life reality. Mm -hmm. And I think it is happening. I agree with Arif, Hannah and uh, Regina, uh, their thoughts very much. So I think that the landscape of discoursing, the landscape of uh, integration and interaction is changing. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can be more imaginative and think that the recalibration calls for greater recalibration and being a little bit more brave and a little bit more giving at the same time yeah. and being mindful. That's uh, that's a great last word. I'm not saying it's your last word, but it's close to your last word. So that's brilliant. Um, so actually, I'm going to ask Regina just to respond to that or respond to the question. But as I do that, we've got one last really short poll. Um, and it's actually right exactly, Uchita. It's, it's, in the, it's in the spirit of what you were just saying. And that is, uh, what gives you hope for the future? Um, you guys have just uh, described uh, something that's just a, a circumstances and a context that are complex and challenging. Um, there's, you know, often trust issues. There's inertia. You know, there's just getting everybody to work together issues. There's, there's lack of resources. Um, and then we have a pandemic on the top of it. So Regina, what gives you hope for the future? Thank you. Well, basically, I agree with everything Narif and Chita just said. The, I will say that our silver, silver lining, like talking about Yucatan specifically, was that we had had, had a, hard, a hard time uh, gathering and getting together with the businesses, so, like without the business sector. And the pandemic actually brought us all together. And, um, that, and that way we, uh, we learn to work with each other. We learn uh, to trust each other and to coordinate efforts, not, not only um, 
like I'm gonna do this and you're gonna do that, but more like I'm doing this and I can I can help you exponence that what you're doing by doing that. And mm -hmm. that effort actually we one of our like main uh, initiatives during the pandemic was something called Yucatan Solidario, which means literally means solidarity, uh, Yucatan solidarity. Yeah. Um, and we gather different universities, business, businesses, um, civil organizations, and along with initiatives from all over this, like all over the society and help actually bring, to help uh, bring food, medicines, or, or even uh, fin financial support to the people that were more in need during this yeah. pandemic. So yeah. for me, the silver line is that it's, as, as I say, like we cannot do this uh, alone and the fact that during our hardest year, we found a way to connect, to work together, and to um, work, work for the same goal, which was like saving Yucatan, saving our people. It's, um, I think it's, it's the greatest, um, it, it, it was the, the greatest thing that, that this pandemic left us. Great. Oh, thank you, Regina. All right, so I'm actually going to give um, Hannah. I'm going to give you the last word before I we just uh, turn it over to Olaf for closing words. So Hannah, last last word. Oh, thank you. That's an honor. Um, <laughs> well, I would say, um, like, yeah, the impact of the pandemic, um, like on inequality in Germany, also economic impacts. Um, we will only observe in the coming years. It will take time to really realize what are the impacts. But I'm, yeah, I think what leaves me with hope for the future is really that we have the recovery plans, that we do have created a momentum for sustainable development to build back better, um, to build back forward. I think this, this is very important. And yeah, I think it's now up to us, to the governments, to, to society, to stakeholders, to, to really, yeah, make this a reality. Um, and um, I think in Germany, we still have a lot of room for improvement to build back forward um, and yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to to see this and I think this is something we will discuss in the coming years still mm. because yeah this is a long-term impact and yeah. uh, a long way back into mm. the old reality or a new reality hopefully. Mm. Thank you Hannah, thank you Arif, thank you Uchita, thank you Regina and as uh as we move to Ola, we've got the, the poll shared there. I just think I, I love to end on in the midst of all of, uh, of the difficulty of all this, but there is so much hope, um, I think, and I really appreciate um, your uplifting final remarks, all four of you. Thank you so much for a very invigorating panel. I feel like we were just getting started and just unpacking, yeah. and now it's time to go, which I guess is always the case. We just hopefully we left people wanting more. So thank you. Ola, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Christy. I think you left me with a very simple task, which is just basically to thank all of you, you, Christy, for moderating this session and all the panelists. I mean, it's a very enriching discussion. It's so interesting to hear and encouraging to hear about how these platforms are really our fertile breeding ground for innovation, inclusiveness, and convergence of interest and resources. Um, I just want to assure uh, everyone that we will post uh, and there will be a summary of this. We'll post the presentations on our website and also the, the video link. And that's really not, that's really all I have to say. Just thanking everyone and please keep uh, posted on upcoming um, uh, webinars and different topics that we will address in the coming months. So that's really all for me. And thank you so much. Mm. Thanks, Ola. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Great. Oh, Thank that was you. really fun. Yeah. You guys are amazing. You're amazing. Oh, Thank my you. heroes. Thanks. Have a good day.